back to the future. In fact, this is part nine of the series. We talked a little bit last time if we met together about the tribulation period and it, what, it, what it is in regard to the end times. But this week, we want to deal more with the events involved in the tribulation period period itself. We've been showing you a chart each week of what we're looking at as, as kind of an overview of, of events that from the Father's house, the Lord Jesus comes. And prior to that, was the past ages and the prophets of the old covenant and the establishment of the covenant with Israel. And then the Lord Jesus is coming as Messiah, his birth, his death, his burial, his resurrection. That kicked off everything. Remember those parting words, the disciples by the angels, Jesus is ascending into the heavens. He said, you men of Israel, and why do you stand here gazing into the, to the heavens? This same Jesus will appear in like manner. So we've been waiting for that appearing. In fact, it's called the glorious appearing in Scripture. But Jesus told us, the prophets told us, the apostle warns us of all the things that would happen from that time, from the, from the, from the ascension, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus to the, to, the, to, the, to the coming of Christ, we call the blessed hope, the glorious rapture, uh, when that would take place. Jesus said many events will happen. He talked about signs in Matthew 24. We looked at the signs of global affairs and political affairs. Signs had to do with the issues of uh, what would be happening in regard to famines and earthquakes and pestilences, all those things. And we dealt with the signs of wars and rumors of wars and what the Bible had to say about those issues. So we talked about a lot about in that little point right prior to the rapture of the church, all those sign events that would take place. The, the key one of all the signs mentioned that we really should be the eye opener of knowing that we're very near in the end of time is the restoration of the nation of Israel. Uh, the nation was recognized globally as a nation in 1948. That was the kind of thing that perked up the ears of every prophetic student uh, in, in the world at the time. Look what's going to happen. Because of all the events that were taking place, and there had been this escalation of events from wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, pestilence, disease, all those things, there, had, there, there was in the rapidity of, and it, like I said, it's an exponential thing where it was few to many uh, as we got closer. 1948 was the key signature prophetic sign that Jesus was coming back soon. The budding of the fig tree, as Jesus called it in Matthew 24, the restoration of the nation of Israel. And we'll see uh, how God moves things uniquely in these end times. But after that, somewhere in time would be an establishment of what Daniel we talked about the 70th week, which would be a seven-year period of tribulation. The word there for in the Old Testament Greek word, we'll look at it in a moment, had to do with groups of, of numbers. But what would happen, somewhere in the process of, of these prophetic events, the next big unfolding would be the church would be taken away. The influence of the church, the Holy Spirit working in the church would be gone. It would be anarchy and chaos that would begin to ensue globally, which would bring on difficulty and crisis in the Middle East part of the world, which would introduce Antichrist to come onto the scene. This guy who steps on with great charisma and style and, and uh, seems to be the man of the hour and the man of peace. He does what nobody else has been able to do in the generations that have gone before him. He introduces peace in the Middle East and he has Israel sign a seven-year peace treaty with him. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that when that peace treaty is signed, Old Testament, New Testament, Daniel to Revelation, all tell us when this covenant, this, this, this agreement is made between this, this false Christ, as Daniel basically, for another prince, he's a false prince, when he does that, that marks the beginning of the tribulation period, that seven-year period that happens right before Jesus Christ returns in all his glory. You see the return that the angels prophesied to the disciples take place when he appears in clouds of glory. He comes and takes over the, the planet, basically. No longer does Satan have any control on the earth. Now Jesus reigns as supreme Lord of lords and King of kings for a thousand years. Um, when, we looked at, when we looked at Daniel, we talked about this a little bit. Remember, uh, Jesus says in Matthew 24, he says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then the signs of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now if you remember from some of our sermons that we've talked about clouds of glory, what does that mean? That's that uh, in, in the Hebrew, the Shekinah, the, it, it's the glorious presence of God. It's like when the, the smoke filled the temple because God filled the place and everybody, all the Levites and the priests had to get out of the temple because the presence of God was so obvious. It's that, it's that cloud by day and the fire by night that 
escorted the children of Israel through the wilderness of wanderings. That's the glory of God and the presence of God being manifest. Jesus will come back. I like the way he put it, and this is Jesus speaking in this verse in Matthew 24. He says, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Somebody said, well, what is the sign of the Son of Man? Let me put it simply as I can. It's the Son of Man. He's the, that's the sign. It's the sign of the Son of Man. The last big sign, amen, is the Lord Jesus coming in all his glory. And it says, and they will see who? The sign. Who is that? They will see the Son of Man coming. That's the manifest presence of the glory of God, all right? When we looked in the book of Daniel, and some are still mulling over Daniel in that 70 weeks that, that we talked about, remember that in those 70 weeks were assigned to the nation of Israel and to the city of Jerusalem, and we saw that how that there was, that God said, I have assigned 70 weeks in, in the book of Daniel to Jerusalem, to the nation of Israel that are prophetic, unique weeks he's talking about. Now, weeks is sometimes a little misunderstood by people because really it's the Greek word heptads or, or seven-year periods. Or He said there are these seven-year periods, groups of seven, that are determined for, for, for God's people and for, for the nation of Israel. So if you took that, God said, I have 490 years uniquely, specifically, that I'm going to be doing something in regard to the nation of Israel. Now, we've seen some of those heptads, some of those groups of seven already. He said seven heptads, when he started the prophecy, will be, you know, or 49 years, that when a decree goes forth to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, 49 years are going to be, go by, and then it's going to be rebuilt. It's not talking about the temple, it's talking about the city, right, that happened under Nehemiah. He said that once those walls will be built, there's another group of sevens, 62 groups, all right, of sevens, where, and Messiah shall be cut off. So in other words, Daniel's giving you a pretty much exact date of when Jesus would be crucified. And this is six, 800 years, all right? At least 600 years before Christ is even born. He's saying, hey, Messiah's going to come and he's going to be cut off. When will he be cut off? Well, it'll be 62 groups of seven years after rebuilding the walls. All right? He said, then there's one last group, the 70th group, all right? The, the last, this, this last seven-year heptad, this group of seven that's prepared, and that's, that'll be the time of the, that we're, when it has yet to be filled, and that'll be the time of tribulation. Now, I know this isn't the biggest chart, but I'm going to walk through the events that set off this, this seven-year period, this last group of seven that Daniel talked about, the last dealings that God has in, in restoring his relationship and his covenant with the nation of Israel all take place. Basically, in prophecy, we've seen you know, the, the 70 weeks, we've seen 69 of those 70 weeks happen. From the, but what had to happen before the 70th week could take place, Israel has to be restored. The nation of Israel has to be a nation again. It hasn't happened, all right, for 2,000, 3,000 almost years that, that we've been waiting for the, the restoration of the, of the nation of Israel. We see it in 1948. God says somewhere after that time, Someone's going to come in, and the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, talks about a false Christ who comes in and makes a, a peace treaty. In the chart I'm going to show you, this isn't one of my original charts, so I've done a little work on getting it hopefully big enough to get on the screen. But in, the, in, in that particular chart we'll look at in a moment, we'll see that, the, that there are three major judgments. And this covers really the book of Revelation. We're going to do a whole view of the book of Revelation, probably about chapter 4 to chapter 19 today, all right? But I'm going to just simply lay out what's going to happen in that in that seven-year window, all right, the seven-year window of tribulation and why we have that happen and what goes on during that particular time. If you look at it from Revelation chapter 4, really starting at chapter 6, we did a little bit of 4, but all the way through 19, you'll see that the tribulation period, which is signified by the first half and the second half called the Great Tribulation, had its horrendous time. It is a, it is a horrible time. It's, it's grisly. It's horrifying. It's, it's a terrible time. But in it, God is judging the nations and calling Israel to himself. And so we'll look at this chart. And this chart begins with, when does this seven-year period begin? When does this tribulation begin? It appears sometime after the taking away the church, the, the, the after the church, somewhere in there, Antichrist comes and signs the seven-year peace treaty. That sets off the seven-year period. We've seen the establishment of the nation of Israel. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for really the next big event is when the Lord takes the church away. Now, that is prophetically symbolized in the book of Revelation when John in chapter 4, remember John's writing the book of Revelation. God gives it to him. The Bible says he is caught up. Remember, what was John called? He was called the beloved disciple. Well, the church is called the beloved, all right? So when the church the beloved is caught up into heaven, then it starts this whole process, all right? So we see shortly, and probably due to all the chaos of all of a sudden millions of people being missing, you know, the Middle East situation goes, to, 
intolerable and the Antichrist comes, this, this political genius steps on the scene who looks like a political genius and offers peace to the world and to the Middle East and Israel signs this accord with him. And it's a seven year peace treaty. It ain't no peace though, all right? He introduces maybe with just a little false peace, but it doesn't go far. And so if we break down this chart, we're going to see that there's going to be judgments. And he talks about the seal judgments. There's a scroll with seven seals on it. He talks about the trumpet judgment in the book of Revelation, each trumpet representing a different judgment during the tribulation period. That happens in the first half. And then we'll lay out the second part of the, the chart, which represents what we call the vial V-I-A-L are the bowl judgments in the last part of the tribulation. So he talks about the woes and the judgment that will come. So let's look at these. What I've done, there's about 33 events that take place here. From Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 19 that take place, 33 events that fill up all these judgments and bowls and trumpets and all this stuff and angels and, and demons coming up. All this takes place. So I want to lay it out to you just kind of a step-by-step -step process as much as we can understand it from the book of Revelation. Obviously in chapter 4, John assembled the church that's taken up to heaven. Uh, and Daniel in chapter 9 talks about the Antichrist shortly after that, signs his covenant for seven years. And that trans or inaugurates, should I say, the tribulation period. I've laid this out hit the right numbers here. I don't know how well you can see that. Put it up on all screens, please. Uh, where you can see it, but that's, that, that thing that looks like a breakfast burrito is a scroll, all right? And it's a scroll, and this scroll had seven seals on it, but I've numbered them. There's a number. Number one is the rapture. Number two is the beginning of the tribulation, the signing of the, the agreement with Antichrist. And the next thing are the seal judgment from Revelation chapter 6. And there are seven seal judgments that are mentioned here, all right? Christ opens the first of those seven sealed scroll judgments. And the rider of the white horse, probably Antichrist, appears. He uses political diplomacy, you know, uh, to bring this seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel. And he makes promises of peace and seeks to establish his, his one-world government. The second seal on that scroll in Revelation chapter 6 talks about the introduction as a result of Antichrist wanting global control, a world war that breaks out, all right? Some people are not going to go for it. Others will. The, the next seal, the third seal, begins as a result of the, the, the war, obviously. You see all this famine and suffering, economic chaos, inflation, the aftermath of this global, this war that breaks out. The fourth seal results, as do all wars, in death, but in this case, the death that occurs as a result of these judgments being poured out is one-fourth of all the l folks that are living on the planet and one-fourth of all living creatures die as a result of these first three or four seals that take place. Now, by today's standards, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about you know, a couple billion people who die in the first part of, this, of, of, of the tribulation. And in chapter 6, verse 9 and 11... It talks about it also during this time about a lot of people are coming to Christ and there's a martyrdom that takes place, all right? Who's being martyred? Who's losing their lives? They're, in the process of all that's going on, I'll back up in a little bit and talk about how there'll be two witnesses that come and they introduce the gospel and they're preaching on the streets of Jerusalem and they'd have miraculous signs and wonders. There's about 144, not about an exact number, there'll be 144,000 witnesses that come out of that preaching and that's described in chapter 7 of Revelation and these 144,000 people who were born again and saved on the streets of Jerusalem they go out to the whole world I mean there's probably millions more are giving their life to Christ all right as a result of these witnesses but these go out to preach the gospel to the world and all around the world they go and they share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It describes that, that number in chapter 7. It talks about how many of them, those who come to the Christ at this point, they, they, they lose their lives, they're, they're martyred by governmental leaders and by what the Bible calls the harlot, which is a universal church. Somewhere after the, the, the rapture of the church, you know, the world's open to all this deception and all the world religions are brought together under one person. Antichrist is over it all, it looks like, but there's really this, it, it's, the Bible calls this, this false church, this false religion, the harlot. So they all come together because they're completely deceived. But what you have to realize is that evangelism during this period is incredible. Even though the world is being judged by all these sore judgment, a lot of people are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is absent, remember. We're gone. But you have these 144,000 apostle Paul-like believers who are not ashamed of the gospel who make powerful evangelists. 
Now that's taking place during these fourth and third, fourth seals that are happening. In Revelation chapter 6, another seal in verses 12 through 17, the sixth seal is now open and it introduces the wrath of God being poured out in the form of tremendous global earthquakes, the likes of which have never been experienced. In fact, it is so severe, it's a global shaking that people are begging the rocks to, to, to fall on them so they can, they can lose their life. The seventh seal in Revelation chapter 8 introduces what we call the, the seven trumpet judgments, all right? That ends the first quarter of the tribulation period. In fact, not only does it end it, it prepares it for an even worse part of the tribulation called the day of God's wrath. We call it not just the tribulation, we call it the day of Jacob's trouble or the day, the day of great tribulation. In Revelation 8 through 7, that first judgment, and I've, I've numbered these members, there's not going by a certain number. Like if I say the first trumpet, it's number 10 on the chart, all right? Number 10, the first trumpet judgment results in one third of all the trees, all the green grass, being burned up by hell, fire, and blood that's being cast upon the earth. Tremendous loss, you know, uh, 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 of the green upon the planet. Number 11 on the chart, that's the second trumpet, and it sees a great mountain of sulfur falling into the sea and destroying a third part of all the seas and all the living creatures in the seas. In fact, it says in Revelation that even one-third of all the shipping vessels are destroyed. In other words, this great mountain of sulfur has a tremendous poisoning influence on the oceans, but apparently it creates some kind of tidal effect or tsunami effect where one-third of all the shipping vessels are lost. I mean, think of the Poisidon, the Poisidon adventure about, you know, uh, one, multiplied by one-third of all the shipping vessels in the world are lost. Number 12 on the chart represents the third trumpet, and that, that causes a great star or a meteor that's called wormwood, meaning bitter, to fall on the, the fountains of the waters of the earth, and a third of the rivers turn bitter, resulting in the poisoning death of millions of people. The twelfth, the thirteenth number on there represents the fourth trumpet, which results in one third less sun, one third less moonlight, one third less sunlight, less moonlight, and less starlight. But basically, does it extends the darkness of night? And these are dark days for the planet. Number 14 represents when a special angel flies around the earth. And this angel has one specific cause, is to warn people that there are worse judgments to come. Now, it would seem to me if there's a, two men on the streets of Jerusalem doing signs and wonders in the name of Holy Jehovah God, in the name of Jesus, and they've sent out 144,000 people, that's a lot of folks, to all the nations of the world, and they're preaching the gospel of peace and the gospel of grace and the gospel of salvation, and then you've got an angel flying around the globe <laughs> warning that, hey, you think it's been bad? It's getting worse. Listen to the men of God. The 15th point on the represents the fifth trumpet. It introduces a hideous demon-like creatures like, described like scorpions and locusts out of the bottomless pit, not able to kill men, only to torture them so badly that they themselves will seek their own death and they won't find it, the Bible says. Revelation 9 represents, in chapter 9, verse 13, is the sixth trumpet. It's the 16th number on the, on the chart. This introduces 200 million horsemen. And I believe these are demon-like, spirit-like death angels. And they're released upon the earth, and they kill another third of the people that remain upon the planet. That occurs then that right there in the middle where you have the 40th and the 42nd month, the first part of the tribulation. This happened now. This brings about 50% of the population on the planet at the, beginning of, at the beginning of the tribulation. Now about half the population has been destroyed at the midpoint of the tribulation. And many of these people are people who took the mark of the beast. They took the sign of the Antichrist upon their, upon their, their heads or their hands and they're marked by God at this point as incorrigible. A basket of deplorable, so to say. These individuals have taken the mark of the beast. Estimates upward of a quarter of the people living at the time will be saved under the preaching of the 144,000. So a lot of people dying are also the saints who are being saved under the preaching of, of those Revelation 144,000. 
fact, it's possible that 75% of the population of the earth, 25% of that by martyrdom, but 75% has been destroyed during the first half of the tribulation. It's billions of people will lose their life during this first three and a half years. Many of them say because, and die because they won't take the tribulation. Now, I have some friends who are strong believers who really believe that the church is going to go through the first half of the tribulation. I don't see any premise for that. One, because I believe in the blessed hope the Bible talks about where the Lord comes as a thief in the night and takes away those folks. Remember the passage where Jesus talks, comes a thief in the night, two are fields working, one is taken, one is left, two in the bed sleeping, one is taken, one is left. What's it represent? In other words, there's going to be some people who stay, some people who leave, it an appearing by the Lord as a thief in the night when he raises the dead from their graves, those that have been saved, resurrection time, glorification time, and the saints remaining on the earth at that time are taken out, which I believe opens the door for all this wrath to come, all right? That certainly is not characteristic that God would have us endure this first part of, of tribulation. It doesn't fit with the scriptures. When the Bible, Jesus says, you know, that, that there are people who are saved and who are, are, are delivered from the wrath to come, or the hour of trial, as the scripture calls it, that will come upon the whole world. The Bible tells us we'll be saved from that. But understand, at the same time, there will be people who are saved during the tribulation. The Bible talks about in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, when John says, who are those? And he says, well, those who have come out of the great tribulation have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, up here on the chart, number 17 represents those witnesses. In, in Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 through 14, it tells us that they have been here and they've been prophesying 1,260 days. All right? They've been going for years now in a ministry which if taken literally would correspond with that 42 months of judgment already described. So they were there preaching during the first half of the tribulation for the most of it. Obviously, I believe these two witnesses, they're real people with miraculous power who perform signs and wonders. The Antichrist hates them. The global religious system hates them. During the entire first half of the tribulation, and I believe they're the ones who spur that 144,000 who are sent out preaching. Many more are saved than that. But it is a dreadful time but even during this dreadful time, God is providing a witness to the world. The salvation's available. But the world continues to reject it. They don't want God. Humanism is ruling and reigning. And we see the results of humanism is nothing but judgment. The 18th mark on that chapter uh, of, the, of that chart represents a passage out of Revelation 11, chapter 15. And it talks about the seventh trumpet of judgment that comes. And it introduces an awesome, the awesome event that's described in chapters 12 through 18. But it's the most severe set of judgments reported. It's, it's what we call the vile judgment or the bold judgment. It starts in the bottom of that chart you'll see in Revelation chapter 17, 1 through 18. It says at this point there'll be the destruction of, of this false religious system, this Babylonian, the Bible talks about the great harlot. What is that? When all these religious systems are merged together during the first part of the tribulation, because the truth is gone and people are open to such deception. You have this harlot church, this, this apostate church who rejects the deity of Jesus and rejects the word of God. And it's easy to see how those people can come together after the rapture of the church when all truth is gone. But this is a powerful system, this one world religious system that, that takes place. And it's being allowed to take place by Antichrist. He's using it to manipulate what he wants. And this 10 king federation that we talked about, we talked about the vision of Daniel a few weeks ago a couple of weeks ago even, and how that they would rise to the scene. But the harlot seems to be riding this, this beast. It's headed by Antichrist and by these ten kings. But at this point, somewhere mid-tribulation, the midpoint, they make war on this religious system and they kill her and destroy her. Number 20 on the chart, Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 and 3, when it talks about the process of killing called, we call it mystery Babylon, the harlot, this false religious system Somehow, in the process of all this, Antichrist receives a head wound and is killed himself. He gets a deadly wound, the Bible says. In chapter 12, it tells at the same time Satan's been cast out of heaven. All right? Remember, he's had access, according to the book of Job. He's the accuser of the brethren who's always going to the Father and accuses not. He's cut off now. He has no more interest. So now he comes to the earth, which he wants to control, and is doing everything he can to control, and literally resurrects, inhabits the body of the slain Antichrist, and resurrects him anew, even more vicious than he was before. Now he's completely dominated, not just by demons now, but by Satan himself. 
the 21st mark on that chart up there represents how the Antichrist is now incarnated. He now forces the remaining people on the earth to worship him. Remember, that's where the, the abomination of desolation is talked about, where the Antichrist goes into the temple in Jerusalem, which obviously that's part of the covenant agreement. They're allowed to rebuild the temple. But all that had to take place for the seventh, fifth week to be fulfilled. He goes in and declares, hey, I'm God now. Of course, this is the devil's aim. He takes the throne of David. I'm God, and I, will, I am going to be worshipped, and there is no other. And so there he is, now incarnated, and it says now he forces the people who remain on the earth to worship him, and only those who don't worship him are the ones whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You say, what's that? That's the next sermon to come, all right? <laughs> we'll talk more about that. Is your name in the book of life? Good. Everybody's name's in the book of life, but not everybody's name's in the Lamb's book of life. And we'll discuss that. 22 up there on the chart represents the false prophet. He, he will replace the slain religious system. He's pretty much the only mark of religiosity going on now. And he forces everybody not to worship God, but his goal is to have them worship the Antichrist and his image or be killed. And everybody's going to be compelled now to bear the mark of the Antichrist, that 666 number, in order to hold a job, in order to buy food, in order to sell anything, in order to operate in, a, in, a, in any kind of form. And economically, you'll have to have this. Again, I believe the church itself is not going to go this. All right? But in number 23 marks the first bowl or vile judgment. Okay, Antichrist has declared himself to be God, and now the greater judgments, bowl judgments, vile judgment. The first one, marked by 23 up there, causes giant sores to appear on anybody who's rejected Christ and has taken the mark of the beast. You can buy, you can sell, you can trade, but you also get big sores. Miserable pain to endure. The 24th mark represents the second bowl judgment or vile judgment, and it's poured out on the seas that have already been so torn up, all right? It turns the seas now into blood as that of a dead man. And now every living creature in the sea dies. Gone. The 25th mark represents the third bowl or vile judgment. It turns the rivers also and other sources of water into blood, especially just judgment because the people remaining had killed all the saints, who, anybody who was surrendering their life to Christ. The fourth bowl, represented by number 26 up there, intensifies the sun's heat. It gets hotter until ungodly men now begin to blaspheme God directly, expressing their hatred toward him. The fifth bowl, represented by number 27 on the chart, Revelation 16, verses 10 through 11. The fifth vial says, this bowl causes darkness to cover the throne of the Antichrist and his entire kingdom. And the sores, during the point tells, will continue unrelentingly they produce such agony, the Bible says, that men will gnaw their tongues for pain and blaspheme God and refuse to repent. Number 28 on the chart is the sixth bold judgment or vile. And what happens is it sends lying demon spirits out to the kings of the whole world with one purpose, to bring them down to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, as the scripture calls it. We call it the battle of Armageddon when the nations are gathered together and there's this great battle that takes place. The 29th mark is the seventh bowl, the seventh vial, representing our Revelation chapter 16. This is verses 17 through 21. The seventh represents, results in judgment of God that destroys the entire world system, judges all the remaining unsaved men severely, and even though enormous hailstones fall, the unregenerate people still refuse to repent. In fact, this judgment is so devastating and so encompassing, it prepares the world for the greatest event, the big event, the glorious coming of Jesus Christ to set up a true, righteous, just, earthly kingdom, which is represented here on the chart by, by the, the slaying, the destruction of the commercial government of Babylon, the new world order, that order of humanism that puts man at the center, Satan promotes has been yearned for by so many since Babylon, it now occurs. Possibly during the seventh vial, since it fits there, just before Earth's final judgment, we have the new world order finally in complete place. But who wants anything to do with it? It, it, it collapses Antichrist's order, all right? It takes its place. 
and now men are in control of their own destiny, they think again. But it prepared the way for the last great event of the tribulation, and that's number 31 on the chart. It's the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the prime minister of all prime ministers who sets up a just and righteous leadership and reign over the earth for 1,000 years. Now, these are, these are leading up to that glorious event. These are traumatic, horrid, difficult times. That's why I praise God for the blessed hope it talks about in Titus, for that thief in the night appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ where he takes us out of here. There'll be a lot of people who will get saved as a result of the witnesses and the two witnesses and 144,000 witnesses, but thank God for the blessed hope. Now you know why we call it the blessed hope, amen, that, that, that taking away of the saints off the planet because judgment is getting ready to fall. You say, well, Brother Joe, with all that that goes on, why? This tribulation, what is it really all about? Let me give you four quick reasons why, the, why this, the tribulation. One, by the way, everything God does has a purpose, all right? And sometimes multiple purposes. A lot of times we're only concerned about what is his will in my life, but you need to wake up and realize that God's working in the whole world, <laughs> in the cosmos, in the universe, but he always has a purpose for what he does on an individual purposeful plane of my life and also the greater purposes of what he's doing in his kingdom according to his word and his promises. And when you examine the word of God, you won't be disappointed because God begins to reveal his purposes and all that goes on, even this climatic, horrible times. One thing he's doing here first and foremost is to bring an end to time as we know it. Because when we enter into the heavenly place in the eternal ages one day, even after that thousand year reign, time is done. All right? We'll not be bound by time and space any longer. So introducing the events that culminate with the tribulation, the return of Christ in Daniel 9, the prophet spoke in Daniel of the consummation of the ages or the consummation of the time. He says, and God will bring an everlasting righteousness. That's what this is all about. The tribulation is obviously a fitting consummation of the ages of that grand experiment with Adam to the second coming. Adam came, God created Adam for his purposes. God created Adam, Adam to, to know him, to fellowship, to walk with him. And Adam blew it and he sinned. And God, for those last five to 6,000 years, will have shown his mercy by continually invading with his word, by continually invading time and space, by his spirit, ultimately by his son, and giving us the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Hey, that, you know, he's a righteous God. But man continues to seek his own will and purposes. Man's been given a grand opportunity to respond to God, and he hasn't. So it'll be a wrapping up of that, but also to fulfill Israel's prophecy. Much of the tribulation, really 90% of it is really just about Israel coming home to the Father and home. The Jewish people began to return to the land during this last century with the recognition of the nation of Israel in 1948. You know, and all that's described in the Old Testament. It's described in Daniel, it's described in Jeremiah, it's described in Ezekiel. Over and over we see how that there'd be, there's these prophecies about Israel returning, rebuilding temples. There's these prophecies about renewing temple sacrifices. All that's going to begin. I believe it begins as part of Antichrist deal, just to get Israel to go along. But it all comes to place as God fulfills his covenant that he made with Abraham to the people of Israel. The third reason is to shake us, to shake man from his false sense of security. You are not the master of your own destiny other than making a righteous choice for Jesus Christ. The more stable the world gets, it seems that man thinks that he got himself there. The more prosperous men become, the more they think they got there by themselves. They do not realize they have what they have by the grace of God. They do not realize they breathe because of the grace of God. They do not realize that they have jobs and families and children because of the grace of God. They do not realize that their life is for one thing. It's for the glory of God. And now man has rejected that. And now the world begins to so fall apart no matter what he does, no matter how he moves, no matter how he operates, it just keeps falling apart. And he finally realizes, I don't have any show. I don't have any play. I don't have any power in this. I can't make any difference. So man is shaken from his false sense of security and his false confidence. And even in this time where his, his confidence is being shaken, look at the grace of God with 144,000 people who are going out across the globe offering forgiveness and offering repentance and grace. 
That's the reason. To shake man from his self responsibility. But the fourth reason, to force man to choose Christ or Antichrist. Major purpose, one of the major purposes of the tribulation is to get the billions of individuals living at that time during the seven years an opportunity to receive Christ or Antichrist. Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to serve? That may be part of what Daniel meant when he called it the consummation. <laughs> it all wraps up. It all comes together. And literally, there'd be millions upon millions of people who are going to give their life to Jesus Christ at this particular time. They're going to be during this time, billions of people who have an opportunity to receive Jesus and many who reject it. If they choose Christ, according to the book of Revelation chapter 7, they'll be called the servants of our God and receive the mark of the Father upon their foreheads. But it's also open season for those who wait to this moment to receive Christ. Their lives will be taken. It's doubtful that many if any tribulation saint survived the tribulation by the time it gets to the end. It's going to be a horrible time. On the other hand, people that accept Antichrist will have his mark placed up on their heads or the forehands. And it seems to be the final irrevocable decision. But notice in this midst of this tribulation, hell on earth, you see in the midst of this horrible time, you know, it becomes clear there's a spiritual war raging. You see these demons being loosed from pits. You see angels being released from heaven. You see angels going around the globe preaching the gospel. The forces of Satan, the forces of hell. You see the forces of God acting and moving. You see the loving nature of God during this whole process still reaching out. I mean, gives us, this gives us, even in tribulation and judgment, it gives us an insight to the merciful, gracious, loving God. The angel says he goes out and he preaches an everlasting gospel to all of mankind, to every person that dwells on the earth, to every nation, in their tongue, in their t and, and in their languages, they receive the gospel. I already know that God offered mankind one last opportunity to accept his son by the way of salvation through the testimony of the saints, the 144,000 witnesses, but just to make sure everyone hears and has the opportunity to, to, to respond, then he sends out an angel to every person, every language with that call to repent. And the people are challenged by the witnesses and ultimately by the angel of God. Fear God and give glory to him and worship him. And those who do, according to John, there will be many. Those who do will be saved. Those who refuse will worship Satan and be lost. Now that's What's to come? That's what the Bible describes in the days of head. Now, I just sat down there and I thought, you know, man, what does that mean for us that are here prior to the tribulation, before all this takes place? I think several things. One, repent. We, we just need to repent. The church needs to repent. People of God, God need to repent. We need to quit being so worldly-minded, so secular-minded, and get our hearts and our minds set back on Christ and realizing that, yeah, we have, we have responsibilities in the world around us. We live in a secular, physical world, but we also have a spiritual world all around us. And we need to be comprehensive of what God's will is for our life and comprehending what our responsibilities are to other people in the world. God loved me. Yeah, that's great. I don't need to throw a party about that. I need to realize God loves other people and start being used by God. But if I don't change my heart and my mind, that's never going to happen. Repentance has to be the cry of the day. It's not time for preachers to be standing in pulpits spewing out pablum and baby formula for Christians. It's time for preachers to stand up and be prophets of God. And there's a hard day coming. We're responsible to preach the gospel. We're responsible to warn people. We're responsible to encourage the saints. We're responsible to reach a lost world while time remains. The Bible says we work while it's daytime for the night is coming. So we're here and we're children of the day, the Bible describes us. So we need to be people of the day. So we need to personally repent as pastors, as people who fill the church pews and seats in the church and say, hey, God has a purpose for my life. Let me fulfill what he has. Second word would be this. Remain. While you're here, stay focused. While you're here, stay stable. While you're here, until the Lord takes us away by death or rapture, you be committed. You be faithful. You be constant. You be that, that, you don't be up and down and in and out and back and forth. I'll do this. I won't do this. No, you need to be consistent. And the Bible describes very clearly there'll be a lot of people who proclaim the name of Christ and some who are genuinely saved whose hearts will grow apathetic and cold because of the iniquity of this day and age. I mean, it's, it's not surprising we can look around and see how much sin is acceptable in the culture that we live in. 
how things that we used to disregard Guard how things we used to shun, how things we used to push aside is sin, are so easily accepted by Christians in the culture we live in. Things that, that, that at one time in our life we thought, well, that's, not, that's, that's wrong, I would never do that, but times now Christians find themselves doing those very things they thought were wrong. And so there's no consistency. And the Bible says, because the love of many, will, it says, because of iniquity will abound, the love of many will wax cold. We don't need to be cold, we need to be fiery hot. Brings me to my third R. Just be radical. Be radical. You know what that means? What it means to be radical? Anybody know me radical? You know who's radical? That girl and that guy who just gotten engaged. They're radical. They're radical about each other. They're radical about their relationship. They want everybody to know about it. They're sending out letters, invitations. Hey, we're going to get married. You guys need to come. Bring gifts. Here's where you can find out what I want. Check this side out. We're radical. We're going to start a house. We're going to start a family. I mean, we're in love. We kiss each other in public. We hold hands. We open the car doors. I mean, we're just, that's just radical. We just, hey, we talk about each other. Everywhere we go. People are sick of us talking about each other. We want, you, we want everybody to get together just so you can watch us make our vows and kiss each other. These are radical, all right? What makes them radical? They're in love. It's time for us to be so in love with Jesus, we're writing everybody, inviting everybody, bringing everybody, talking about everybody, and just loving on Jesus in front of the whole world, no matter what the world says. The last thing about living a radical faith is rejoice. These are hard days coming, but the Bible says, hey, in the midst of all this, you rejoice. Your redemption draws nigh. This whole thing is getting wrapped up with a big bow. It's almost over, which when it's over, it means the beginning. It's just starting. We need to be excited. The King of kings and the Lord of glory is coming. You know? We need to be excited. We need, we need to start rejoicing now. You know, you've got this opportunity to praise the Lord. I can't understand my, you know, we can sing some of these songs. We sing a praise and worship, and some of you just sit there like this. You need to get some practice in because there's going to be a lot of that going on in heaven. Right? Open your mouth. Well, I don't, I don't sing very good. Hey, it doesn't say sing very good. It just says make a joyful noise. All right? Just, 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 just make grunt, groan for Jesus, whatever it takes. All right? Join in because we're going to be doing that around the throne of God. It, it's, you say, well, you know, I just don't. I might, my people might hear me. Hey, it's not about you. You ain't got that down yet. It's not about you. It's not about the band. It's not about the vocalist, all right? It's about Jesus. It's about honoring him. It's about serving him. It's about loving him. Well, you know, Brother Joe, I just like to hear everybody sing. It's not about you. We're not singing to you or for you. Can I get a witness? I love Jesus. I don't want you expressing my love for me. I have my own to express. No matter what it comes out sounding like, I don't love Jesus. I want to sing to Jesus. I want to worship Jesus. Well, Brother Joe, this seems like that might get boring if that's all we do. How stupid can we get? I said we, all right? But if you're saying it, how stupid can you get, all right? <laughs> I don't know where you think that you're going to go to heaven and you're going to get in line somewhere, and when you get in line, the first line you go through is kind of like getting to basic camp, you know? They're going to give you your boots and pants or whatever, you know? They're going to give you what you need for the first few weeks. All right? You're going to get your little white robe, and you're going to go get your weapon, which is your little golden harp. And you're going to go get your little harp, and you're going to get stuff, and you're going to go get chains, and you're going to get your harp, and you're going to be assigned a cloud. All right? You're going to get your own little cloud, and you're going to sit on the cloud for the next billion years. Pudling, pudling, pudling. There is... I think we may go there because you can't imagine how great it's going to be. But that's not heaven. That's, that, that's not even the millennium. Even the millennium. You're going to be in charge of the world under Jesus' command. The saints will rule over the nations. Which I'll probably get the waste department in Magnolia, but that's fine. <laughs> that's cool with me, amen. As long as I'm doing it for Jesus, Hallelujah. 
But we're going to have responsibility, and our responsibilities and the blessings that we get to experience in eternity are based upon our faithfulness now. Being faithful over little makes you master over much. So live your life radically. Live your life in love with Jesus now and rejoice now because there are great days through eternity to come. There's no telling what God has for us. The Bible says our mind cannot conceive what God has prepared for us. We can't even begin to understand how great it's going to be. You don't want to miss heaven. You don't want to miss Jesus. You don't want to miss these moments. What a grand and glorious day. Yes, it's going to be hell on earth for a seven-year period. It's going to be a glorious time. At the end of the thousand years, Satan's going to have his second coming. For a period, the Bible says, he'll be released. And even during the thousand-year reign, there's still people who won't choose to believe Jesus. Miraculous world that we're living in, they still won't accept him. And all that's going to be wrapped up, and there's going to be this great white throne where the just are separated from the unjust, the sheep from the goat, for eternity, and we press on to eternity forever. But live today for Jesus like you believe this story. I do believe it. Do you? And let's live it. This is the greatest life you could ever have on this planet. But there's a greater one coming. Let's stand together. Father, we love you today and thank you for your son Jesus.